It's time. And we're into the 30s now. What are, we've done a fair few of these. The ATM podcast. Mark Watson, international sporting commentator. Talk back host. Good old chum he is. And Martin Devlin from the platform. We're going to talk about the fact that the Blues can't get a crowd on the same day that the Warriors could. And why the hell would you also program an all-whites game on the same day? Cricket at Eden Park on the Saturday. No real crowd for that. The Warriors, though, and Sean Johnson's the Messiah. You'll be repeating that to me, Wado, by the time we finish this conversation. Scott Barrett proves that super rugby players can play more than five games in a row. Sky TV are now at a government department. It's absolutely official. Apologise to me! But I want to start with Joseph Swali'i because this is causing much consternation across the Tasman. They really don't take it well, do they, the Aussies, when one of their own swaps codes and this time rugby wins by getting this young man. Yeah, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because I know from much of my teenage years and nearly part of my life, it was always the other way around. It was rugby that ended up going to rugby league. You've only got to go back to the times of John Gallagher, Mark Brook Cowden, Matthew Ridge, uh, Daryl Halligan. We saw just a sway of New Zealand talent going to rugby league and um, nothing was mentioned then, was it? Look, I think this is desperate for Australian rugby. Um, look, if, if, you know, picking up a winger, picking up an outside back, it's not going to allow the Wallabies to win a Rugby World Cup. I think we've got a dime a dozen of those types of players here in New Zealand and many of them can't actually end up, you know, end up making uh, the All Blacks players like Sean Stevenson, I think, would be, you know, a, 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 w- would be a far better prospect if, if he was available for the Wallabies. So not really sure, um, not really, don't really understand what Australian rugby are trying to do here. And I, I I'm just amazed that they've got that sort of money to be able to throw around. I would have thought taking that sort of money, investing it somehow in the domestic game or in the club competition or just somehow spreading it, even developing greater coaches, I would have thought as a better investment for Australian rugby in the long term than picking up, you know, a, a promising rugby league player. So, yeah, sort of a little bit miffed by it, but very much double standards from those like Gus Gould who are coming out crying, um, how dare he and all the rest of it. It's Look, it is what it is. It's market forces, isn't it? No different to one player leaving one club and going to another because the deal on the table is a better one. Yeah, look, and I think it's very perceptive of you to say it, to also reference, you know, past generations because, I mean, this is how my, you know, I started off the show by saying that this morning. Like, I mean, you know, when I grew up, um, it was always the rugby players going over because the rugby player, players weren't being paid professionally above the table. Let's be honest about that, mate. I mean, they're all getting backhanders all over the chop. We know that. But, you know, in terms of, and look, JK was another one. Mark Ellis was another one. You know, it's for, if you were an All Black, you could get good money going at the end of your career going and playing rugby league. Um, yeah, I'm not so sure that, you know, this generation that they actually mind that much players crossing codes, Mark. And, and, and look, you know, the things, the questions that I've got about it, are, are for a start, is he going to help the Wallabies win test matches? And is he going to help them win a Rugby World Cup? I'd say the answer to that is probably not. And I'm being generous by saying probably because the answer is probably no. And also, I suppose, we've got a reference now, Roger tuvasar Shek and the fact that he came across. And the reason that, you know, rugby is grabbing these players is, is clearly it's a marketing exercise as much as everything else. And what they want is they want eyeballs from rugby league to turn their attention to rugby and you know there was a curiosity factor when Roger first started playing for the Blues and I think there probably were a few Warriors fans a few leagueies who switched over and thought I wonder to see how he goes but over time you know your attention span and everything else and he's not playing that well he's not making that much of an impact and there are other players that take his place and I don't actually think there is such a thing as oh my god we've shifted this big chunk of audience I think that's just a complete fallacy. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, a Jonah Lomu, um, a Rupini Thauthau and Butha type of player, I think might genuinely uh, conjure up a lot more interest if they were to switch codes how they would go. But it's only short term, isn't it? It is desperate. I mean, if, if rugby is desperate for more eyeballs, well, they've just got to address the product, don't they? They just need to go and win a Rugby World Cup. They just need to be more competitive at Super Rugby. Um, but they've also got to adopt more of a, 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 and this probably moves a little bit onto that next point about the lack of crowds and stuff for the Blues and those numbers that we're seeing at the Warriors. Um, and this is the biggest problem, I think, facing Australia, Australian rugby, New Zealand rugby. We've spoken about this before, Martin, is that, you know, you've actually got to get back to allowing the discussions to go ahead, allow the different narratives, allow players to express themselves, allow us as the media to become on mainstream television and be able to criticise the administration and be able to challenge the teams and be able to critique players and do it open and freely. 
um, and create those multiple narratives. I tell you what, even the odd off-field scandal is not a bad not thing. A bad thing. It gets people yeah. engaged. It gets people interested, doesn't it? I, I mean, you saw the niggle last week in the rugby league between um, between uh, Penrith and Parramatta. Um, repeat of that final, but it sort of there was a lot of hype around it. It sort of lived up to it. It had that niggle. It had that little sort of slightly nasty side to it. And that's what rugby league is doing well. I mean, sometimes it's by default because it tends to just attract sort of oddballs or just tends to attract bad boys generally. And you don't have to do too much to create a bit of conflict or create some issues off the field. But the the other thing, and I think, you know, and this is where rugby go wrong, and maybe not so. Australia, they just simply don't have the depth. No, that's they it. That's it. I mean, yeah, so, yeah, they, they, they just haven't won anything. It's a in sixth so long. division got, sport over there. I mean, that's got, why they're so desperate. You know, we all know that. Yeah. But they've got just simply got too many teams. But part of the reason why people are turning up and watch the Warriors and people are not turning up to watch, you know, the Super Rugby, as we've mentioned, the best players aren't playing every week. In the NRL, the best players play every week and every team has a star and every team has these brand athletes. And even if the Warriors lose, it's a chance to go along and see um, other great rugby league players in the opposing clubs front up and you can sit back and go, oh, it was good to see Sean Johnson today, but man, did you see such and such from that team? And earlier in the year, I got to see, you know... um you know, Manly superstars and Penrith superstars and Nathan Cleary. But you just you, you just don't know what you're getting in rugby, do you? And, and again, there's just no peripheral discussion to have you at the forefront of your mind with that level of curiosity to turn up and want to watch. And that's proven by the fact that, you know, Opeki got no crowds at all. And, and you know, the embarrassing thing about it is not that. The embarrassing thing about it, I, I point the finger at the mainstream sports media and all the hype and all the drivel that you spoon fed us for months and months after the Rugby World Cup when the women won that, that it was going to be this, it was going to be that. And there's not a single story, I have not read a single word from any of these same journalists about, oops, no one's turning up and no one's watching. Now, you know, this is what, uh, you know, this is human, humanity says that when you stand up and spout about something, well, if you proved wrong at the end of it, that then the decent right thing to do, and especially if you're in a position of responsibility and privilege like you are working for the sports media, is you put your hand up and you say, well, in actual fact, uh, this is the reality, this is the truth, and we didn't get this right. And yet, you know, th- that sound you're hearing, that's the sound of, of, of the actual courage and the fortitude and the conviction of all of these people because none of them have the balls to get up and actually say what you and me are, are saying and that this is a product which people aren't watching. Now, for whatever reason that is, and you can come up with a myriad number of reasons, sure, but whatever it is, the reality is they're not. I agree with you about you know, resting players. Look, the Blues played a, a C division team against the against the Brumbies, uh, sorry, against a fourth side who no one knows who the hell plays for them. The Brumbies turned up at Christchurch on Friday and what should have been the marquee match of the round, resting seven Wallabies, okay? And then the Crusaders rest players were... I mean, this is meant to be the premium franchise product of the sport in this part of the world. Yeah. We were speaking to Andy Capistano, you know him, the old mate, last week. He said, in South Africa, he said, now that you've actually... You know, you've kicked us out of Super Rugby. We're not interested in New Zealand. He said, all our tension's up north now. He said, it doesn't raise a ripple. He said, it gets played here on TV. He said, I don't know who pays for it, but no one watches it. And so this is the actual reality of what rugby is facing at the moment. The women's game hasn't been supported. No one's watching it. The men's game hasn't been supported. No one's watching it. And this isn't just today, Mark. I mean, you can't sell out an all-black test. What did we, well, I actually remember last year, TV1 led their news that an all-black test was sold out. I mean, back in the day, mate, you'd queue for five days and nights to get a test ticket for an all-black test. Yeah, but where are the board of New Zealand rugby? Where is the executive of New Zealand rugby? How come they can't identify this problem? What excuses are they making for it? You know, Sky Television, as we've always mentioned, never released the actual viewing numbers. Now, if they were really, really positive, I reckon they would release them. And, you know, the game is in real trouble here, but... It's this mentality, I oh, yeah, but as long as we win the Rugby World Cup, and as I've said previously, you put all your eggs in one basket, you reduce the game to once every four years, and then you don't win. Boy, it's a big gamble, isn't it? It's a big, big gamble indeed. And look, the women's product is just not good enough. People aren't interested in women's rugby. For so long, it's been men's rugby. And there is nothing wrong with it being predominantly a male sport, but it's politically driven, isn't it? Oh, no, we've got to have equality. And, hey, women can play this game as well as the men, and there's the interest there, and they just shove that down our throat, even though that's not the case. There is a political agenda. 
And that's the scary thing for me, Martin. This is not actually about credible journalism. This is using sport for these individuals, for these media outlets to push their political opinions on all of us. When they actually do look at the crowd numbers, you will be. These left wing, predominantly feminist journalists will start pointing the finger at us white middle class men for being the reason, for being the problem, oh, yeah. for yeah. being chauvinistic, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's for it. not turning up. It's our fault, Martin. It's our fault. It's nobody else's fault. It's our fault that, you know, hey, we just don't give the game a chance and they're they head stuck in the sand and, and, and we don't want equality. We're scared of it. That's the sort of rhetoric and crap we're about to get. Apologise to me! It bores me titless. I can't be bothered with it, mate. It's like this goddamn protest at Albert Park. Do you know what, oh. Mark? And this is the truth. There were more people queued up to catch the ferries to Waiheke in Auckland on the weekend, because I went to a, to, to a vineyard on the weekend, to, to sit in the sun with their friends, drink wine, imbibe, laugh, have some food, and enjoy themselves. There was 10 times the amount of people did that than turned up to Albert Park. Yeah, the news is just absolutely focused on a bottle of tomato soup or well, whatever the hell it was, mate. Most of us don't give us stuff. That's what these people don't understand. Most of us don't actually care. We're bored as all. Anyway, let's move on to some more sport. I want to talk about... No, no, no. Oh, no, but on. just on that too, just sticking with this political thing, I do just want to touch on, um, you know, we've talked about Sky Television being part of this uh, campaign too. Uh, I mean, look, you know, I've got family who, uh, you know, have shares in Sky who bought them some time ago, have lost a lot of money in them. And as I've said previously, you know, the shares sit there at about 24 cents. You actually, 24 cents, you get 10 for $2.40 as it's listed in the newspapers. And we've seen the proliferation of women's sport on Sky and the production costs, women's only sports shows now. And then I saw an article last week where Sky have now reached their target of having a 50-50 executive, i.e. 50% men and 50% women. Now, I wouldn't have a problem with that if I was starting to see a major uh, increase in profits, if I was starting to see the share price increase. But that's clearly not the case. And the problem when you adopt this mentality of quality of outcome, it basically means that you've got to discriminate against, discriminate against the best candidate. And you're doing that to achieve balance. And so give you an example. So say you have 10 positions available and 20 of and there were 20 really good candidates and they were all of one gender. You can only actually offer five of those candidates a position. The other five positions must go to people of the other gender, even though there are 15 better qualified candidates. I mean, that's surely not a good business model or fair to those candidates that are putting their hand up. Now, now the same would apply if you were... Um, you know, if you were getting into the management side of this. And let's say, you know, you've got to have four managers, two men, two women. One manager leaves. So what are you saying? The replacement must be of the same gender, regardless of who is the best for the job. And, and this is the sort of nonsense and crap that we've got at the top of Sky. And then you wonder why this agenda has been pushed below that. And so it's all women sport, it's all women presenters. But as we've proven with Alpaki Super Rugby, women's cricket, no one is actually interested. As you'll see previously, Martin, 80% of Sky subscribers are white males. OK, and I hate to use the word white, but they're the ones that are constantly putting us into these different demographics. They're the, you know, you fill out your census form and you're automatically labelled as European, Māori, Pacific. Yeah, that's it. But what are they actually doing? They've forgotten all about it. And this is just this is not the way you run a company. This is not the this is not responsible to those shareholders. Tell me how this is allowing my family members to somehow see some more return on that initial investment. Show me how this is how sh show me how Sky are making money off this equal outcome mentality. It doesn't work. You cannot have group identity or gender politics. You've got to have you've got to give everybody the same opportunity and you know, equal opportunity, but you cannot have equal outcome. It is a very, very dangerous ideology and it does not stack up business wise. It is appalling and it is nothing short of discrimination. Apologize to me. Let us move to a couple of final topics, my friend. And, and one of them is Scott Barrett can now play five games in a row. And we spoke about this at the beginning of Super Rugby, didn't we? How ridiculous it was, the rest and rotation. And it's been explained to us by All Black Management and everyone else that it's not actually rest and rotation. It's just trying to keep it, well, whatever. 
you know, you can't play five games in a row. Well, we've got an injury crisis, and guess what? That guy wants to play five games in a row. I don't get this. I just, you know, I think this is the beginning and the end of the All Blacks. I mean, now our players are actually going to turn up and play rugby, which is the job they get paid to do, Mark. It's a disaster. How can you possibly get our players playing every week? That's not their job. Their job isn't to go out there, lace up boots, and chase a piece of pigskin around every week, is it? No, and hell no. They do that for no. three or four weeks, and then they have to have a compulsory week off like the rest of us do. We're going to turn up to work for three or four weeks, and then we all get a compulsory week off because we need to rest and rotate. I mean, this is just this this single thing that you can change the rules in an instant when it suits you says what a dumbass policy that is right from the get-go. Oh, I mean, you go and look at Stephen Perifetta. He played about two games in about seven months last year, but he's got this blanket, you must have a ban mentality. I mean, as we've said, Martin, you've got to play three major test matches in the space of 15 days if you're to win that Rugby World Cup. Yet we've convinced the players that four or five games in a row of super rugby, you can't actually do any more. I mean, to take the example of Roger Tuivasa-Shek, he put his hand up at the start of the year and said, no, I want to play the preseason. I need to play more rugby. So he's been playing. What happens? He ends up picking up an injury. Now, so he's going to actually have a rest now by default, which is the case with most rugby players. At some point throughout a season, you are probably going to pick up a nickel and you're going to miss a week anyway. But what we do is we still just have to make sure, though, that, hey, you're going to have a rest even outside of that. It goes back to our original point. Why are 19,000 people tuning up to the Warriors? Why is there such a high level of engagement in the NRL? Why are they doing $2 billion television deals and rugby stuck in some sort of $400 million rugby deal? You know, Warriors getting 19,000, Blues getting six or seven. It goes back to this very point, mate. And then what happens if we don't win that Rugby World Cup? What have we actually achieved? And then we get the next guy coming in. And four years from now, judge me on the World Cup. Let our players rest. Hey, as long as, guys, I tell you what, when you have the week off, Martin, let's make sure, though, that we're building up our Instagram followers, okay? Because we want you all having Instagram followers. And I tell you what, we'll even run some courses so you can put little flashes of lightning and fire on your boots when you score tries and losing all black test matches because that's what we've lowered ourselves to. Oh, I mean, honestly, it's Mark true, Robinson mate. and these guys sit here and we're expected to believe. Have you actually ever tried to apply for a job in these organisations? No, it's impossible, oh, I mean, mate. No, there's no way that, you know, we're... You no, can't we're, even get your foot in the no, door. No, we're cis males. Oh, there's no way, mate. There's no way we're getting I, anywhere near it now. I mean, I have worked with a, um, a, a, a female at the moment who has a high-powered role with the New Zealand rugby within the women's game, who I have to say was the most inept person I've ever experienced in a previous sport who had another political agenda, but oh no, ticked all the right political boxes, all at the right time, interviews bloody well, and here we hand you the responsibility of the women's game. I, I mean, honestly, and we will, we've said this previously, we'll be having these focus groups in four years on what's wrong with the game. What's wrong with the game? I've said it before. Just let it. Best players play every week. Get the best teams playing. Nobody I know is in this country, Martin, wants Super Rugby in the current format. We just want a good, bloody quality yeah, NPC, that's mate. What we want. That's all we, that's we want. want. Yeah. We just want to go back to our roots. We want to go back to the damn regions. You know it. I know it. But I'll keep saying this too. What? And I've said it before, and I'm sort of waffling on a little bit here, Martin, but Sky have got to be concerned. You've invested $480 million in a product. It says that you, in that level of investment, which is way higher than anything they invest in, hey, we sink or swim on rugby. What are they doing? What are they doing to try and secure that investment? What are they doing to try and leverage that investment? Nothing. They are a PR firm. They are the ones that are killing the engagement and the interest in the game by actually just saying nothing. Rugby has reduced itself to 80 minutes in the middle of the park, often just with B-sides every week, and the product is not good enough for simply that to happen, Martin. Apologise to me! Finally then, I'm going to get you to say after me, Sean Johnson is the Messiah. You've been harsh on Sean Johnson. You don't believe in Sean Johnson. Sean Johnson was the difference against the Bulldogs. This is his year as much as it's our year. What a, whatever, I mean, however you want to actually interpret that. The fact of the matter is the Warriors are a hot ticket right now, just like the Breakers. The Breakers were selling out their stadium because they're winning. The Warriors are winning, and winners are grinners, and the Warriors will keep getting 19,000 as long as they keep winning. And this is a team that is actually standing up and actually 
doing the things that you expect a professional side to do. Because what what the what the what the big lie was last year? Oh, it's all about COVID, and we got to get back home. No, the 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 reality was the players, as Stacey Jones pointed out, gave up. And you know he's been muzzled now. He never says anything like that now. But he was so disappointed after watching those players refuse to tackle, and as he said, play with no pride. But this Warriors side under Andrew Webster is actually different. You can see it. Even you can see it. Oh, look, yeah, it's been a really good start to the season. You're right, Sean Johnson was the difference um, between the two sides on the weekend. Uh, Look, I I said it last week and I'll say it again. Just the thing that comes out of all of this is how do so many rugby league players get to the highest level in the game but yet are so mentally weak? I mean, what are we doing in identification the talent identification. I've always said this at a young age, don't look at the brawn, look at the top two inches, find out how you can best test that, particularly under duress. And it's clearly some area where the Warriors and other rugby league clubs just haven't got it right. But look, all I'll say about Sean Johnson is, and this is a, a, I remember when I was sort of helping Mark Sorensen, uh, softball great, um, and he was doing a triathlon and we'd sort of talk a little bit about philosophy and some of the philosophies he had. And he came up the line, he said, if you're going to be the man, be the man every week. And I guess that's what I'm still waiting from Sean Johnson. I need to see Sean Johnson be the man every week. I need him to see him to be Joey Johns. I need him to be Alfie Langer. I need him to be um, that that player every week, not, not just in bit parts. And so, so far, he's ticking some pretty good boxes. But am I going to jump up and down and call him the Messiah? Um, too early for me, like you, Martin, to wake up and having smoked a bit to, to say that. Um, but yeah, look, well done to him up to this point. But I need to see that fire. I need to see that defensive side of him in the months of June, July and August when it's wet and we're 17 games into the season and there's a few injuries. And then that guy stepping up and taking the game to the opposition. Devlin. Down goes Frazier. Down goes Frazier. The Platform.